I want to ask you a question. Actually, during this message today, I'm going to be asking a series of questions this morning. We'll answer as many as we can in the time we have. So bear with me, but do listen carefully, if you would, to the questions I'm going to ask. The first one is, what does baptism and that commitment mean to you? One of the important responsibilities of God's servants is to preach the Word in season and out of season. To be reminded, as we are each Sabbath, a feast festival of the Lord, a feast of the Lord, we need to continue to go back over and remind and look at and examine the Scriptures to see if these things be so. Uh, my daughter once made a comment, she may be listening, she made a comment, Dad, don't just say you don't need to turn there, you all know that Scripture. Well, it's important not to assume that everybody here and online and me know everything so well we don't need to talk about it anymore. So have you thought about what does baptism and that commitment mean to you? Have you thought about it recently? For many of us, baptism may be some a very recent memory. I would wonder if anyone here or online, I don't need a show of hands or a shout out, but that has been baptized 30, 40, or 50 years. You may have. Probably. Some of us may have been baptized as a child or an infant, if we can remember back that far. And many today do not realize there is a difference in adult baptism and infants or children. We do not follow, teach, or believe in infant or child baptism for many reasons. The most primary one being you're not going to find it in Scripture. That's why we don't do it. And some would be deeply offended by that. But your fellowship, your church, your religion, whatever you're part of, if it teaches infant baptism, baptism okay, your children, catechism, some call it, all those things, you can't find that in Scripture. Baptism was and still is the single most greatest commitment you will ever make in this physical life. More than marriage, more than your mortgage payment, more than taking care of your children and your family, more than taking care of your spouse when you were old. We make to God, when we're baptized, a commitment in this lifetime Nothing you will ever do is more important than that decision. I've had some argue about that. They've discussed it. I don't agree with you. It is clearly described in this, the Word of God, our Bibles. Along with that commitment, you have repented, and not only asking Christ then to live in you through His Holy Spirit, but help you to live. Be willing to sacrifice and give whatever it takes to serve Him as your Lord and Master. And I want you to listen very carefully. We are at a time in this nation, every one of you, if you call yourself a Christian, a servant of the living God, having made this commitment, you're going to have to give whatever it takes to serve your Lord and Master. So you have been put on notice. Okay? That's scriptural. I want to go through the baptism ceremony that sometimes uh, for someone newly ordained or uh, as a minister and elder, the minister would, in this case, I, if I were baptizing someone and you were standing in front of me, I would say, have you repented of your sins? I don't say all your sins because that's not possible as a human being because you don't recognize all of them. So I will say, have you repented of your sins? The person is supposed to respond, yes. I had one time a person say, no. So that's a whole other story. But have you repented of your sins? The person then responds, yes. Okay. And then I say, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And the person responds, yes. And then I ask them to state their name. I don't say full name. Because when I did that in Spanish, it became da 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 all these names, and I couldn't remember them all. It was hard enough to remember the, uh, the ceremony in Spanish. 
But, so I would say, please state your name. So if it would be Joe Smith, instead of Joe Rodrigo, Felipe, you know, all these names, just Joe Smith. I would then say, since you, Joe Smith, have repented of your sins, which are contrary and against God's holy, righteous, and perfect law. And since you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Master, your Savior, your High Priest, and soon coming King, I now baptize you, now listen carefully, not into any sect, denomination, or fellowship of this world, but into the name of the Father and Son and through the Holy Spirit. I do this in and by and through the name and authority of Jesus Christ for the remission of all your sins. So be it, or amen. Pretty profound words, if you think about it. And so, how often do you and I, do we consider why we are baptized? Was it to get something? You know, I've had some over the years. I learned later. I had some discernment, but I went ahead and some are baptized because they want to marry someone that is not part of the faith. That happens frequently. Well, I'll just be baptized. Then we can get married and it'll be okay. And that's a whole different sermon. Some get baptized because somehow they want the power of the Holy Spirit to do things. Speak in tongues or heal. You know, I, I remember a famous man, he's probably dead now, Ernest Ainsley, the famous TV healer. And I'm not making fun of him. He was sincere, I believe. You know, but he would say, be healed! You know, and people would just fall backward, which, good indication based on Scripture, you should study that. But, you know, or to speak in different tongues, which means languages, by the way, and not an unknown language, some just muttering. That's another sermon as well. But if you desire to be baptized for those reasons... As I've told many, when you go under the water and come up, all you're doing is getting a bath. You're getting wet. Well, God has to honor when you lay hands on me to receive your, His Spirit. No, He doesn't. He knows your heart. Right? It's not my job to go through all that. And Well, I'll, no, I think God does. And some want it so they will have the gift of teaching or preaching. Again, that's not the right reason. And I've had some that fall in all these categories in my ministerial experience in serving, assisting. The reason for baptism is that we recognize what we are, what we've done, who we need to be, Christ needs to live in us, and we need to make sure we're washed clean. What does our baptism mean when you put all of life together do you need to be baptized? Here's another question. Do you need to be baptized to enter the kingdom of God? You'd be surprised how many people can't answer these questions. And they say it doesn't matter, but it absolutely does. Another question I'll indirectly answer today in the sermon message is also about those seeking to be baptized or a clearer thought, when should someone be baptized? When we are mature enough to reflect on and consider what it is we are doing in that commitment, what we're making, why we're being baptized. You need to understand that. That's why we don't, one of the reasons we don't baptize infants or children. I mean, I'm in my 60th year and I don't understand some things. But when I was six, I didn't understand the commitment of baptism. I understood some things in the Bible. So, a person understands what he or she is doing, why, and what the commitment means. You know, sometimes some do not, and if their heart isn't right, all they do is get wet. Is water baptism really necessary? This is another question I've been asked. Couldn't it just be a good person? I mean, they're so good. I could just profess, I believe, and Christ will judge, I'm a good person, Open the door, let me into the kingdom. Many teach that. You just believe. Well, belief means what? 
If you love me, keep my commandments. Whoa, that's a little red flag. I'm not sure I can get into that. I just want to believe. Let's go to Acts chapter 10, verse 34, because sometimes this enters in. Acts 10, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. So whoever believes on him will see, receive forgiveness. God's not a respecter of persons, as someone clearly discussed with me recently. He doesn't say, well, hey, I like you better. you got money, you're, you're with it, you're educated, you've been studying the Word of God, you're a very powerful speaker, so you can come on in. But you, yeah, you know, you're just, you're homeless, you ain't got any money, you need a shave and a haircut. I don't think so. Not right now, maybe later because you're not going to give enough money into the tithe box or the church. And you know, it's sad we have to say that, but that's true. If you don't think that some are in for the money, you need to wake up. So, yes, water baptism is necessary to enter the kingdom because there's only one baptism. What does a baptized person look like? Does his or her Halo shine, right? Anybody here got a halo, right? We're changing on the inside. You've repented, agreed to let Christ live in you, not the old you. Human beings do not have halos, by the way. The Bible nowhere talks about humans as such. Angels don't have halos either. Do some research on where that came from. That's another interesting study. I'm often asked this question, or some have said, I need to see a sign that others will see too to know that I'm a Christian, that I'm baptized. What signs would be prevalent? What would convince you for me to look at you and say, well, you're obviously baptized and have Christ living in you because I can just tell by looking at you, right? If you've been baptized one month or 50 years, what signs would you expect to see? Let's proceed a little further. How do you know you were truly baptized when you were and your baptism is still valid? In essence, how do you know your baptism is genuine? These are just all questions that we need to talk about. We read in the book of Acts, the apostle Peter witnessed signs that some actually needed to be baptized. Signs that convinced him these people should be baptized. So let's go back to Acts chapter 10 and continue. We were already there. And let's go down to verse 44. While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell, and all of them which heard the word, you know, including the Gentile members, right, of Cornelius' family, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, and many as came with Peter, because that on Gentiles, this word ethnos in the New Testament means nations, also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with languages and magnify God, and answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and he asked them, to tarry certain days and to stay with him. So these signs convinced Peter. Why wasn't that good enough? Why baptize them? The signs were there that they had God's Spirit just as on the day of Pentecost some years earlier. When you're baptized, do you speak in a foreign language? When I got baptized, I spoke a very little Spanish, but I didn't start just rattling away and give a sermon that Sabbath in Spanish. Right? Or call somebody in Mexico or Peru or Bolivia or Chile and say, Hola, que tal? Como esta? You know, tiene hambre? No. I didn't do that. And so, what happens? Do you speak in a foreign language? Do you have doves above your head? I've had people say, um, after they're baptized and hands laid, I'm waiting to see the doves. I'm like, what? You know, I'm not making fun of them. They're sincere. They want to see the doves. Or a glowing halo. You know, some of us 
due to having that welding shield, got a little bit of a shiny spot. I got a shiny spot up here. You can probably see it getting bigger. But that's not a halo. And sorry, brother, I love you, but that's not a halo. You know, what about a rushing mighty wind? When you were baptized, I mean, I, I baptized people one time in the ocean there in Cartagena, and there was quite a wind coming across, so maybe there was a rushing mighty wind, and then the water came over and doused us. But yet we do have signs, you know that? That we should find in those who have God's Spirit of, in them signs of their baptism. A better word would be fruits. And you and I will notice change, thinking differently, not self-centered, but God-centered. Christ told us what to do. After we're baptized, it begins to define our baptism. So if you would like a title for this message, and here's where I'm going with this. If you would like a title, some like titles. I get emails. I would like a title. You know, it comes up on the, web, the website and on the YouTube channel with the title, but you want it, and that's fine. So here you go. Take up your cross and baptism. Take up your cross. Oh, I use the word cross. Okay, I'm not listening. Take up your cross and baptism. That's the title, and I want to define what that means and more in this message. Let's examine that saying in all its completeness today, that directive that Christ gave. Go over with me to Matthew chapter 16. I want to look at a pivotal scripture. Pivotal, rather, not pivotal, but pivotal. Maybe it's pivotal too, but Matthew 16. It's a very profound one because it's a central theme of what this message is going to talk about today. Matthew 16 and verse 24. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, let him, excuse me, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Okay, so you're putting yourself into the number two position at the very minimum. Okay? If any man will come to me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's if you desire to be part, to have Christ in you, and to be like He's told us to be. I want to examine this verse in the context of what Christ is saying and using here. We also need to remember, as Christ speaks to His disciples, they're already baptized. The same posture most of us find ourselves in, so take note of this. It relates to all those who were baptized according to what God clearly outlines for us in Scripture. It also relates to those who seek to know what baptism represents. So verse 24 again, what does baptism look like? I'm going to give you some points. You, first of all, must have the desire and want to be baptized. Seriously understand what's happening and why we must be baptized. Because to enter into the kingdom of God, you need to repent and receive God's Spirit. You can't do it just as you are, sweet Jesus, as a physical human being. And a lot of churches teach that. That's not from Scripture. And so we must want to repent, to have a changed life, and no longer live like we've been and do. I've been follow, uh, having for several uh, weeks and months now, now we're studying what is Christianity, that way of life, on Thursday evenings. And so... Here's, remember this, Christ has never forced anyone. Many thousands of Jews heard him speak. How many believed him? Even his brothers and sisters, we sort of forget that, they didn't believe or have the desire to follow him. They loved him, they liked him, but they didn't believe the message. And so Matthew chapter 13, let's go back. Where do I come up with that? Substantiate those claims, okay? Matthew chapter 13, verse 57. 
And they were offended at him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. So he did many mighty works there because he, he could not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And brethren, part and parcel to what we live sometimes, we are not able to do mighty works because of our unbelief. Because we will not let Christ live in us the way he should. We think we are. And we just can't figure out why we can't do certain things. Sometimes God says, no, it's not for you to do right now. Sometimes it's because we don't believe and obey Him. And so, in John chapter 7, let's, let's look at this a little further. John chapter 7, in verse 1, what did His brothers do? We read right through this sometimes. John 7, verse 1 after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee that he would not walk to Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. That, that's a wise thing. <laughs> you know, if I know somebody's going to kill me and I find out about it, I'm not going to go there. If God orders me, I'm going to test the Spirit and make sure he wants me to go there. Now, the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. His brethren, right, his physical brothers therefore said unto him, Depart and go into Judea that the disciples may see the works that you do. You know, they, they said, just go, leave. What is one of the signs of baptism that Christ is living in you? Have you thought about that? Matthew 13 talks about that. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 44. Again, the kingdom of the heavens is like unto treasure hidden a field in which a man has found it. He hides and for joy therefore goes and sells all that he has and he buys the field. I know some people, they're not about to use any of their financial resources to serve God. They won't do it. You know, there are some that will uh, attend and listen and be part of a fellowship, the body of Christ for decades never tithe to it, never give an offering, never do anything to give any of their time. And they consider them part of the body. One of the signs of a baptized Christian is never forgets is that you have the desire to be baptized and repent, but you must be willing to give up everything. I'm not just talking about tithing. Be willing to give up. If God says... Your job's over. you got to walk away from this house. You have to walk away from this mate. You're going to lose this child. All the different things we could fill in the blank. And we say, wait a minute, God, you promised to bless me if I obey you. Yes. But he said, are you willing to give up mother, father, sister, brother, and your own life also? I believe it's coming in the future. I'm not looking forward to it, if it happens. But some of us, he's going to say, are you willing to give up your life? We must carry with us the desire to belong to God and let Christ live in us. Matthew 16, verse 24. Matthew 16, verse 24. You know, Again, we must deny ourselves. Have we thought about that? This is a sign of a converted person. It means we are more concerned for the well-being of what? First of all, our Lord and Master and others, serving others, sacrifice and service to God and others. Many of us learned that when we got married. And then we had children. Right? How many parents? How many single parents? I'm going to pick on men because I be one. How many of you as a man when you got married said, what? I can't go buy new Krager rims for my car? I got to buy groceries for another person? Of course we didn't because we're so deeply in love. What have you been married 30, 40 years? Okay. Oh, I don't get to buy this or go here and do this. Or maybe your mate is sick or your children. Right? 
Oh, you have to give up and let go, right? That's why some people stay single. Some people don't want to get married. Some do, but so, and they, they haven't for a while, but some don't because they don't want to have to worry about anybody else but them. And God says, that's got to be reversed. That's got to go away. If you catch yourself worrying about what's in it for me, what do I get? You need to take notice because you've forgotten what you agreed to in the contract of giving yourself to Jesus Christ. Do God's interests come first in your life? Right? I faced a challenge a couple years ago, coming up to the anniversary date. I was told, walk away from what you're doing and go get a job at wherever. And it weighed on, it gnawed on me. I'm like, I can't do that. Then others said, well, just retire. Take an early retirement. Obviously, they know more about my financial condition than I do. But they said, just take early retirement. Go fishing. Go, I won't say golfing because somebody here loves golf. Go, go, whatever, whale watching. You know, whatever you're going to do. Don't worry about people. Don't worry about what maybe God wants. Just go. You know, and that wouldn't be wrong to, to do some of those things at all. No, that's great. But do God's interests come first? Do we seek God's knowledge to be in our minds and hearts? Do we desire to have relationship with the being that gives us life? If you're not daily spending time in this, you need to stop and evaluate, what am I doing? Well, I know all that. I studied that 30 years ago. Bet you don't. Not a day goes by as I'm reading this and I don't say, oh man, I haven't studied that in so long. Oh, that's what, wow, I forgot. Right? If I were, I won't do it, but if I were to ask, or even on the, any of you, you know, if this was a Zoom conference to inter, interrelate back and forth, and interact, or any of you to come up here and I'm going to stop the sermon message and I want you to explain with my Bible why you keep the Sabbath? Why you're worshiping today instead of tomorrow? And use Scripture to support it. I dare say some would say, no, I'd rather not do that. Do God's interests come first? What about daily study and prayer? Do we seek God's knowledge to be in our minds and hearts, sincerely desire to have a relationship with the being that gives us life? Is the Sabbath... The only link we have with God and His people, we're so busy in our daily lives, we don't have time to interact, fellowship with others. Do we call? Do we talk? Do we visit? Or do we come on the Sabbath and then see you next week and then all week long, we're in our world. Do we recognize we've been equipped at baptism also? for warfare through repentance and having Christ live in us via His Spirit. Right now, if you haven't noticed, we are in a spiritual warfare. A very serious spiritual battle. You remember the story in the Bible? I think it was Michael that said, sorry, I'm seven weeks late, but we got this over in this sector of the universe, this huge spiritual battle. I couldn't get here fast enough. There's a battle going on. You don't see it. I see it. It's very clear what's going on right now, the spirit and the children of disobedience, where half this nation is tuned in. Man, they got such a reception. They got that. You remember you used to take an FM radio and then it'd be clear? They're locked in. And other people are struggling. And others are saying, that's not of God. Others just go along like, eh, it don't matter. I got my money in the bank. I got my Lexus. I got my nice house paid for. I got my health. Catch up with you later, God. And he's knocking. He's saying, wake up. And we're like, oh, it's all good, man. Income is coming in. We have our worship services. We got our television show, whatever it is. It's all good. And he says what? Awake. Salvation is nearer than you think. 
2 Corinthians 10. Let's go over there. Anybody else felt this just deep, heavy, luck? Am I the only one? Anybody feel that? Maybe not sleeping real well? Because it's just yuck. It's so evil. It's so wrong. That's not godly. That's not God's spirit. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. So, you know, if you're worried about the fleshly dangers, now we need to do our part. But if you're worried about that, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, spiritual through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. The other word is reasonings. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. That's a tough assignment. That's a tough assignment, especially since this is not our Father's world. I won't sing that song because it's not our Father's world yet. We fight a daily warfare. It's a spiritual one, one that we can't survive without having repented and Christ living in us through His Holy Spirit. At baptism, it is like admission, if you will, into the school or academy of Jesus Christ, a very special one that any can enter if they will accept the invitation through God and the Father inviting. We're teachable. Are we teachable? If our mate points out to us, you need to do this, I ain't going to listen to you. Are we teachable? If one of us points out to each other, You might think about this differently. Have you considered this? No, we know what we're doing. I know what I'm doing. Is that being teachable? Right? Are we self-willed? Are we willing to quickly correct others and try to show how we know this or that? Or we know more than someone else? We're the only true church. You can't come in here without the proper identification that we recognize that you know how spiritual you are. (coughs) Christ, Jesus Christ was our master and is our master. The master of self-denial and seeking his Father's will. What is John chapter 5, verse 30? Let's go there quickly. (coughs) John chapter 5. Verse 30, Christ said, I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't need time to talk to you about it. That's the revised slandered version. He says, I can of my own will self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. We must follow Christ's example. Deny our own will, as Christ said. To those who desired Him, let Him deny Himself. A humble, teachable, contrite heart is one that has truly understood baptism, what repentance is. Christ said in Isaiah 66, To this man will I look, that has a humble and contrite spirit and trembles at my word. How can you tremble at God's Word if you're never in it? I'm not that naive to think any of us, me, you, at times are not in it because it's written all over how we live and the decisions we make. I'm not pointing the finger, okay? I'm looking in the mirror. I'm just sharing what God says to all of us. A humble and contrite spirit. Remember, we're looking at what baptism looks like or should. Back in Matthew 16, 24, which we read earlier, it says, Take up his cross. What is being discussed here? When most of us read these words, what image comes to your mind? Christ dying on a piece of wood, the ultimate form 
public form of punishment and humiliation. When he struggled on his way walking to Golgotha in agony, he had to carry part of the cross until he couldn't go anymore. When Christ spoke these words we read here, he was quite alive. When Christ picked up the cross or part of the tree that he was on to die on, that's the cross. Most of us picture it in our minds in Christ. He hadn't done that yet. When Christ died on the stake, there I'll use that word because some people get hung up on cross versus stake. I had an individual give an entire sermon one time and then a congregation I pastored to clarify I was wrong the week before. I really appreciated that. Not. When he died on the stake, he was carrying our sins to his death, but we can't do that. Only Christ could do that. So Christ was not stating for us to do that, was he? Because we don't die for our own sins. So in reality, what was Christ stating here? What do we, you and I, take up here? Our burdens, no matter what they are. The Greek word for cross here is staros. A stake or post set upright, an instrument of capital punishment, figuratively. This is how Christ does mean it here. Exposure to death, publicly, openly willing to do whatever it takes to follow Him. What's it going to take to follow Him? Have you thought about it? I'm not trying to scare you. What's it going to take? You're about to see in the next few weeks, months, and years ahead, days ahead. To embrace the condition which God has appointed to bear the troubles, difficulties we may meet as we are refined for His purpose. We pick our burdens, we pick our debts, finances, health issues, chores, family problems, our uncertainties, not all of them, but they're here. We have to pick them up and carry them. Christ did not say every time He would always pick them up for us so we didn't have to lift a finger. I think we sometimes sit on the, our own sideline waiting for Christ to pick up our problems and solve all of them for us, we don't really want to put much effort or try. We'll just let Jesus do it all. We have to do our part. What did Christ promise to do for us? Here's what, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 8. Here's what He says as we read God's Word, what He wrote. He said, Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me. The Amplified Version adds to that. All you that are labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in to your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Be refreshed. That yoke. I grew up in a farming community. And way back in the day, we used to take and put oxen together, or sometimes mules, and you hooked them together with a yoke, and they pulled a plow, and they opened up the soil. Okay? Fascinating. And you had to work with them, and you know now we have all this fancy machinery to do all that hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that's why farmers are in so much debt. But that yoke, they had to be together. You couldn't have a horse and a cow, or a donkey and a horse, you know, or a huge Brahma bull, let's say, and a small calf. They had to be yoked together, right, to be coupled to Christ, connected. He's living in us. You know part of the strain we're feeling right now is we're battling this, but Christ said, let me in. And we're like, I am. He says, no, you're not. Not enough. Let me in. I'll give you peace. I'll give you rest. And so Christ is stating, I will show you, teach, and explain to you how you need to live, what you should be doing. 
From the parable of the talents, let's go over there. We have this statement by Christ, Matthew 25. Matthew 25 and verse 24. Then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you were a very, this word here, scleros, a very harsh, you know, very difficult man, severe, reaping where you had not sown and gathering where you had not thawed, strawed rather, sorry. And I was afraid. What's it say about the righteous? We're bold as a lion. I think it's Proverbs 28, 1. He said, I was afraid, and I went and I hid the talent in the earth. Lo, and there you that you have that is thine. His Lord answered and said, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew, did you, that I reap where I don't sow and gather where I have not yet strawed? Going down to verse 30. And cast you the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why does he have to do that? Because Christ expects us to make a profit spiritually, meaning to grow what we have. Some of us. Where'd you go in the first month of October? Oh, vacation. You did? Yeah. Why do you go every year then? Why don't you go during the summer? Why do you go then? Oh, it's time I get off. Instead of, I went to keep the festival of tabernacles outlined in the Word of God. Well, you don't want to do that. They're going to make fun of you and say, you idiot. Right? What are you thinking? You don't have to keep that. Right? Do we hide what we do? We go to church, we fellowship, but when people ask us, we're like, no, 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 I don't think so, I'm not going to say much. Right? One warning I will give you for all of us. Do not make up more crosses or burdens than you can carry. Some of us create our own cross and burdens. Make wise counsel decisions based on God's law in connection with Him, in talking with Him, in studying, eating, digesting His Word, permitting Him in desire to live in us, and then ask. But we have to do our part. Apply yourself like you have to do all of it and then allow Christ to do what you know you can't. Let Him live in you. I'm going to ask you a question I'd like you to think about. Is Christ calling you to serve Him and you're not doing it? He's saying, I could use your help and you're like, no, that's, that's the minister's job. That's the deacon's job, the elder's job. That's not my job. He says, but I want you to do this. No, 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 I'm not. I just, I'm back on the sidelines. And he says, I don't want you on the sidelines. I want you out front, standing in the gap. And you're like, no, when time comes, I'll do it. And he's like, the time is now. That's something we need to ask ourselves, right? I'm getting ready to do some things here in the next few weeks and months because I really feel we need to. Some would say, this ain't the time to be doing some of that, my friend. We just take care of our own little group we have here. We just take care of this little group and it's all good. Right? We have to do our part. He says, take up your cross. Another point that Christ made to show us what baptism looked like when He said, take up your cross and follow Me. When we're baptized, we were washed clean. I took a shower this morning. It felt great. I felt clean afterwards. You know, we used to have that commercial, zestfully clean, if you remember zest soap. I felt good. Now I've been up here speaking and sweating. I don't feel so good now, right? So we were washed clean when we were baptized. A person that's baptized remembers that. And as he follows Christ, let's go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 verse 1. That washing, that regeneration, when you come up out of that watery grave... 
Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to give every good work, to speak evil of no man. And this is something, frankly, we could learn right now. All of us. Whether we like someone or not, speak evil of no man. Oh, it's okay. We're in a, we're in a, a race for the presidency. It's okay. No, it's not okay. Speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness to all men. For we ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will say that you affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. So be careful what you post on Facebook or say to others. Please be careful. These things are good and profitable unto men. So we're washed, we're regenerated, we're clean. David in Psalm 51 said, Wash me, make me whiter than snow. He repented. That's what baptism does. It's what it looks like when we follow Christ. It's what we look like when the fruits of God's Spirit dwelling in us, it will become outwardly apparent. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I, this, this chapter is absolutely profound. Here's what happens when baptism, repentance, and God's Spirit is alive in you. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you shall appear with Him in His glory. Mortify, kill, destroy, therefore, the members which are upon the earth. That doesn't mean each other. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil lust, covetous, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience, and it's coming. And they which, in that which you also walked, sometime when you lived in them, but no, now you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Don't lie one to another. You know, there's 12 different things here. Don't lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek or Jew, circumcision or non, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the effect, elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. A lot harder than it is just being written, isn't it? If any man has a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave you, so you should. Above all things, put on godly love, which is the bond of perfectus. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you also are called to one body, and be you thankful. Are we still thankful that we live in the United States of America? that we can worship and fellowship. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Wives, submit yourself to your husband as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Don't be bitter against them. You know, so many men, we just are bitter. 
So quick to correct our wives, some of us. I, I've done it. Love your wives. You know what? Somebody said, if you want your wife to treat you like a king, treat her like, treat her like a queen. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is pleasing well unto the Lord. I don't have to listen to my parents. I see a lot of that. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be frustrated. Servants, well, we could go on. What happens is when baptism, repentance, and in God's Spirit's alive in you, you're going to see this change and live like this. And it's going to be noticeable. Right? We must be baptized to enter to God's kingdom, repent, and be forgiven and washed clean. What else are we missing that maybe we can't see? We must not forget our calling to baptism. It's a precious calling. I want to read a letter that I've sent out because sometimes people will ask, is baptism essential for salvation? Because the Bible shows that it is. When thousands of convicted Jews asked Peter and the other apostles how to act on their conviction, Peter's response was to the point, Acts 2.38, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The biblical record shows that the ministers baptized converts in water. The gift of the Holy Spirit then begins a process which eventually culminates in God changing Christians to spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. That change to spirit is the essence of salvation, saved from eternal death. Many nominal Christians fail to understand that conversion is a process, believing instead that it's only a momentary emotional experience in my heart. Without a complete understanding of the Scriptures, we cannot understand why baptism should be necessary. Of course, forgiveness is instantaneous, but conversion takes time. It takes time for God to educate us in His will. After we learn right from wrong, from His point of view, it takes time to develop character. We either develop it or we become one, <laughs> right? You ever heard somebody say, oh, what a character? By analogy, we can learn a profession from books, but only experience makes one a professional in a given field. Godly character grows out of choosing right from wrong, exercising one's willpower to do what's right, even in the face of internal and external pressure. Both human nature and the world pull us away from God's way of life. No one has the willpower to be a Christian. We all need the help of God's Spirit. And the way He promised we receive it through baptism and the laying on of hands. The Scriptures further reveals that God gives His Spirit by that laying on of hands, by His ministry at baptism. This is another essential step in the process of conversion that many of today's Christians overlook or know nothing about. Do we appreciate the instruments Christ has provided to help us learn? His church the body of Christ, His brethren, His Bible, this, His ministry, His family, His baptism in us. Are we humble, teachable, committed to our calling? Do we continue to repent? That's what baptism means, in part what it looks like. Let's go to two final scriptures here, 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts, letting Christ live in us. Let's go down to verse 16. Wherefore, excuse me, verse 16. For which cause we faint not, though our outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed day by day. For this light affliction, it may not seem like a light affliction, but this light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It is beyond anything you can or I can understand. 
Well, we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. Whoever gets elected, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. We're getting caught up in it, all of us. We look, what? For things we can't see that are eternal. On this day, Christ predicted he would die. He made a statement to his disciples. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Pick up that piece of wood and follow me. We thank God for his forgiveness. If we truly repent, stop worrying about ourselves. Give yourself away to Jesus Christ, and to others. It's pretty simple, actually. But it's the application that takes Christ living in us, a complete change of focus and reason for living. That's the hard part. But with God's Spirit living in us and looking to Him, what's coming? A very bright, glorious new world. Don't lose sight of that. Don't get down in the weeds. Don't get caught up in everything going on. Whether we become communistic, socialistic, whether we die, lose our jobs, go hungry, none of that's easy. Nobody wants to think about it. It wasn't supposed to happen in my lifetime. It was supposed to happen sometime in the future. Or be real quick, like two weeks, and then done. <laughs> I understand. Take heart. Jesus Christ said to his disciples, and which we are, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, God, we are just in awe and grateful for you. We know you haven't left, you haven't moved. You're the same today, yesterday, and forever, you and your son, Jesus Christ. We pray for your mercy. We pray for your protection. We pray for your help. We pray for your blessing. Father, create in us a clean heart. Help us to be bold as a lion and do your will, to live it. You said you take no pleasure in the soul that holds back. Father, help us not to be like that. Help us to lock arms together spiritually and be about doing the work that you've given just like Jesus Christ, all of us to do. Bless the meal today, please. Bless the fellowship, Father. Protect us. Dismiss us. Be with us. And we praise you. We thank you. We love you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.